Okay, we'll start with this. It's time for the Ring IQ Annual Talent Search at the turn of the year. Beginning, we like to take a look around, see what's out there, who we need to watch out for in the coming year. And our first candidate takes us to Europe, Germany. We're an unbeaten up-and-comer that goes by the name Fenere Natisri is making waves. A Thailand-born, Germany-based fighter that shows a lot of promise, shows real ability. Nicknamed the Diamond. Campaigning in the women's super bantamweight division, super bantamweight, that's where Mayerling Rivas holds the WBA title. Mexico's own Jamie Mercado, she's got the WBC. Deborah Dionysius of Argentina, she's got the WBO. And New Zealand's own Shernika Johnson, she's got the IBF. Fenerina T3 campaigns among them, sporting a professional record of 12 wins, no losses, and no draws with five knockouts. She can punch. One of several unbeaten up and comers that show promise in the women's super bantamweight division. Unbeaten up and comers like Ellie Scottney, Catherine. Ramla Ali, Nazarena Romero of Argentina. Fenerate Natisri, like those unbeaten up-and-comers, shows serious promise at only 22 years old. 22 years old with an unblemished record of 12 wins, no losses, no draws, five knockouts. Not only does she exhibit ability, but she's young enough and fresh enough that she has all the time in the world to fully hone her skills and fully develop as a fighter with no haste. There's no rush. She's only 22 years old. Having seen action three times in 2021, two times in 2022, she's kept a good schedule, good steady schedule of activity set to return to action in April of this year towards the tail end of it against an opponent that has yet to be announced in what is being billed as a six-rounder. Fenerate Natisri is a balanced fighter. Good balance of offense and defense, measuring the distance before closing it. She's not cavalier. She's not callous. She doesn't throw caution to the wind. Good head movement to slip punches. Good upper body movement to angle away from them. Some ability mid-range to inside. Fenere Natisri is a more pocket-sized super bantamweight than some others. A shorter, stumpier fighter with a lower center of gravity. Good balance. Good combinations mid-range to inside. Uses a traditional high guard to catch the shots on the arms and gloves. Manages the distance well she's not flat-footed she ain't got heavy feet yeah, she's bouncy somewhat of a mean streak she applies educated pressure though should not be confused with an according to Hoyle pressure fighter she don't throw punches in bunches it's not volume for the sake of volume she she times her entry comes in behind the jab to land punches mid-range to inside and she's quick Fast hands, fast feet, and good movement. Good counters. Fenerina Tisri's sweet spot seems to be mid-range to inside, and her being such a small fighter, a small target, she can be hard to hit there. Tricky. It's the best way to describe her. She's not with a major promotional outfit like a Matchroom, a Queensberry, a Golden Boy, or a Top Rank. But because she's already 12-0 and 0 with five KOs, because she's already this far along in her professional boxing career, it's only a matter of time before she comes knocking at the door of a world title shot, a world title opportunity. She's already got twice as many fights as Ellie Scottney in the bank. She has a common opponent with unbeaten up-and-comer Ramla Ali and Crystal Garcia Nova. Ramla knocked out Crystal in her last fight in the first round. That was in August of last year. Crystal shared the ring with Fenere Natisri a few months before that in May. Ah. Dropped a decision. Fenere Natisri is definitely one to watch out for in the year of 2023. This could be the year she ends up challenging for a world title. Another news, Connor Ben posted this image to his Instagram stories with a caption that reads, been through hell and back. Thank God for science. The evidence doesn't lie. No holes in the truth. Chris Eubank Jr., ahead of his upcoming fight opposite the ring, Liam Beefy Smith this weekend responded to that by saying, I'm pretty sure it was science that detected the illegal substances in your system on two separate occasions, Connor. So yes, thank God for science. Otherwise, I would have been fighting the Hulk a few months ago. For those not aware, Chris Eubank Jr. has made it clear more than once that 
To his knowledge, Connor Ben tested positive for banned substances on two separate occasions ahead of what was supposed to be their fight, which was ultimately canceled. According to International Boxing News, The Sun have released an article highlighting updates on Connor Ben's situation. A 270 page document explains Vada as the cause of contamination of Ben's sample. The WBC are still investigating this process. Connor Ben is not suspended. He's free to fight. So Vada's gonna take the heat for this? Sounds a lot like Conor Ben's defense in light of these findings is that there must have been cross-contamination. However, Vada handled his samples and someone else's. I don't know. Something must have got in there. Sounds a lot better than what Luis Ortiz said a few years ago in 2014. He said the nandrolone found in his system, that anabolic steroid, came from him eating horse meat. Essentially, he was so hungry he could eat a horse. Tyson Fury stated the nandrolone found in his system way back when, 2016, when that news broke. He said it came from eating boar testicles. These boxers got strange diets. Connor's explanation is a bit more ho-hum, a bit more mundane. He's basically citing cross-contamination as the culprit. The 270-page document submitted to the WBC will explain the contamination of Conor Ben's sample with Vada as the cause. Mauricio Suleiman has outlined the painstaking process of investigating how Ben's sample could have been tainted by Vada. Suleiman told the boxing voice he is free to fight. He is not in any way suspended. So there you have it. The explanation is that Vada somehow cross-contaminated Ben's samples, and that explains the positive test. And he is free to fight, free to resume his career, sporting a professional record of 21 wins, no losses, and no draws, with 14 knockouts, having only seen action once, just once, in April of last year. Opposite the ring, Chris Van Heerden, they had very big plans for Conor Ben, the Chris Eubank Jr. fight. That was supposed to be a very big fight last year, and we all know what happened. I can only assume that they mean to revisit that fight beyond this weekend's fight, beyond this weekend's match involving Chris Eubank Jr. and Liam Smith. Most people think Chris Eubank Jr. is going to win. I think Chris Eubank Jr. is going to win. And if he does, the powers that be can move forward with the Conor Ben fight. Presumably, later on this year, Conor Ben, who's only 26 years old, he only got to fight once, just once, last year. But the silver lining for Conor is that he's a young guy. In spite of having some time to make up for, he's young enough that it really doesn't hurt him all that much. Does the scandal hurt his image, though? No more than it hurt Tyson Fury's image when he tested positive for Nandrolone all those years ago. These many years later, you don't see that many people talking about it. I mean, I get it. The initial reaction is... Everybody's got their tiki torches and pitchforks out as soon as they hear a guy test positive for a banned substance. Oh yeah, initially they do, but once the dust settles and some time passes, you'll find that, you know, testing positive for a banned substance, it's quite common in this sport, happens to many fighters, and that doesn't stop them from resuming their careers. I mean, look at Jarrell Miller. He tested positive for several banned substances on more than one occasion, but he's still boxing. He's back. He's fighting. Luis Ortiz, who I mentioned earlier, he tested positive for two separate banned substances on two separate occasions, but that didn't stop him from resuming his boxing career. Testing positive for a banned substance in this sport is a stain that don't necessarily wash off easy. I mean, even if Conor Ben is allowed to resume his career, which he is, people are still going to bring this up from time to time whenever it's convenient. A cheap shot if you will. But for the most part, most important part is that he's free to fight and free to put distance between himself and last year's Fiasco. You'll be surprised how quickly people forget things in the sport of boxing. The real question now is how soon can we expect to see Connor back in action? And when he's back in action, at what prescribed weight will he be campaigning? Will he return to the men's welterweight division as now is a more opportune time to campaign as a welterweight than before. Errol Spence Jr., that division's only unified champion, is on the eve of moving up to junior middleweight. Most anticipate that he won't come back down. 
Chris Eubank Jr. fight at middleweight is an obvious fight that they can revisit, and it still is worth a lot of money in spite of the controversy. If anything, the controversy raised the fight's profile. It did, but there's also Conor Ben's title run at welterweight you have to consider. Errol Spence Jr. is on the eve of taking on Keith Thurman, his WBC mandatory challenger at welterweight up there at junior middleweight, and most anticipate that he's not coming back down. We know that Jaron Boots Ennis is already in the queue. He's the mandatory challenger by way of the IBF. Keith Thurman, who Errol is about to fight, he's the mandatory challenger by way of the WBC, by way of the WBA. The winner of Ortiz versus Stanionis will be in the Q will be in line to challenge for the full title or be elevated to full champion should the title go vacant. So Jaron Ennis is in line by way of the IBF. The winner of Stanionis versus Ortiz is in line by way of the WBA and Errol is set to already satisfy his mandatory challenger by way of the WBC and Keith Thurman. If Conor Ben can return to action and return to the welterweight division and reintegrate himself into the WBC's rank standings, he might be able to get in line for the title. He might. Resuming talks for a Chris Eubank Jr. fight really isn't his only option. You can go to WBC route. See about getting in position to pick up the newly vacated WBC title when it becomes available because I don't think Errol Spence Jr. is coming back. If he doesn't, there's a golden opportunity there for Connor Ben can start to put this widely publicized performance enhancing drug fiasco behind him. You know, there was a tweet by way of Vada's official Twitter account that caught my attention a few days ago. Vada asked, Why do Bellator MMA fighters not demand out-of-comp thorough pet testing if they want clean and fair fights? Why does show sports not care? Drug use contributes to loss, injury, and CTE. Hashtag protect the fighters. You notice that they tag Showtime's Twitter account. And who's Showtime's executive for sports? Who's their point man? Stefan Espinoza. He's the president of Showtime Sports. I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that he likely oversees both their boxing and mixed martial arts programming. And we didn't see that get the attention. Try and understand, when this entire performance enhancing drug fiasco involving Conor Ben kicked off, a lot of people wanted to burn Eddie Hearn at the stake. It honestly seemed more like an Eddie Hearn matchroom story than a Conor Ben story. I mean, that's how a lot of people treated it. And they used that as an opportunity to take shots at Eddie Hearn and his character or the lack thereof. When here we have Vada inquiring. Asking Showtime Sports outright, why are the fighters on their platform not using Vada? I mean, they tried to hold Eddie Hearn accountable for Connor Ben's positive test. So shouldn't we then apply that same logic to Stefan? Shouldn't we hold him accountable for what happens on the Showtime platform? How does a story like this go unnoticed by the journos? Why isn't anybody talking about this? Why is Stefan Espinoza not under the same scrutiny that Eddie Hearn was under a few months ago? This isn't even the first time we've heard this, you understand. Oh, I know what you're telling yourself. You're telling yourself, well, that's MMA and this is boxing. It doesn't matter. It all falls under the Showtime Sports umbrella. Who's the president of Showtime Sports? Stefan Espinosa is the president of Showtime Sports. Moreover, this isn't the first time we've heard of sketchy dealings over there at Showtime Sports involving what fighters fight on that platform. Not exclusive to the octagon, not exclusive to the cage, also involving the boxing ring. It was performance-enhancing drug expert turned snack empresario, Victor Conti, who stated three, four years ago, about four years ago in June of 2019, Victor Conti stated, my understanding is Al Heyman has requested that Vada not post the test results for his boxers. And he tagged Nicaraguan player, Guru Science, WADA MMA. Can you elaborate on why VADA doesn't publish more info? It'd be nice for them to make a lot more info public and easier to find. It's amazing that that's flown under the radar for such a long time that there seems to be a clandestine effort by way of Showtime and the PBC to keep their findings under wraps. Stefan Espinoza is tied up in all of this. Victor Conti's old tweet, 
involving Al Heyman, the more recent tweet from Vada themselves. Who tagged Showtime Sports, asking why isn't more being done? Whether you're talking about Victor's tweet from 2019 or Vada's tweet from this year in 2023, it all paints the same picture. It all means the same thing. That Stefan Espinoza and these other guys, they don't get the same scrutiny that Eddie Hearn gets. One of his fighters tests positive for a banned substance, and the focal point of the story seems to have been that he's a matchroom fighter. That's what it looked like, yet not but a few weeks ago. Zolani Tete, one of Frank Warren's boys, he tested positive for a banned substance. It didn't get the same scrutiny, and they didn't try to vilify Frank Warren the same way they tried to vilify Eddie Hearn. Think about these tweets from Victor Conti and Vada in reference to the PBC and Showtime. Those two. No uproar, no outrage. I'm just telling you what I've been telling you. These guys that were going after Conor Ben were really going after Eddie Hearn. And they weren't going after Eddie Hearn because they want a cleaner sport. They don't care about performance enhancing drugs and a cleaner sport, more transparency from the powers that be, because if they did, this tweet from Victor Conti would have got more attention in 2019, but it went largely under the radar. The would-be watchdogs who want to hold Eddie Hearn's feet to the fire. Why aren't they holding Stefan Espinoza's feet to the fire when Vada inquires as to why more isn't being done and why more anti-doping testing isn't being implemented on his platform? For the fighters on his platform and their safety. If you care so much about the fighters and you care so much about a cleaner sport and transparency from the powers that be, near as I can tell, these critics, these guys, they don't keep the same energy for everyone else that they keep for Eddie Hearn. That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm telling you. Moreover, there's a conscious effort to sully the image of Eddie Hearn and vilify him, as well as sullying the image of the platform, the DAZN platform. You'll notice that Boxing Scene not that long ago came out with a story detailing DAZN's losses in the year of 2021. A hit piece. Detailing their metrics from 2021 without detailing their metrics from 2022. You wanted to give people an accurate depiction of where DAZN as a platform is now. One would think you'd use the numbers from last year, not the year before that. You don't see those same journos writing about Showtime's losses and how last year they were at around 33 million subscribers, and this year they're down to 27 and dropping. You don't see it. There was a conscious effort to sully and slander the name of Eddie Hearn and the DAZN platform, and that's really why that Connor Ben story got so much attention. It wasn't about performance-enhancing drugs. These guys don't care about performance-enhancing drugs. Because if they did, the scrutiny would be the same across the board it would be the same all around and it clearly isn't in a nutshell everybody's got an angle everybody's got an agenda